So please welcome Patrick Madrid. Thank you. Thank you. You know, it's funny, my wife and I have never been invited to teach natural family planning classes. Um, and Nancy did all the hard work when it came to the 11 children. Um, Archbishop Coakley, thank you for allowing me to be here today. Peter, thank you for inviting me to be here. And my uh, greetings to all of you for being here today. Peter mentioned that I'm on the radio, and that's what I do on a daily basis. I'll tell you just a little bit about kind of the work I do. And then I'd like to share a few thoughts on the topic of why be Catholic. And I'll get to that momentarily. But for those of you who are interested in Catholic radio, you don't get my show locally yet, but it is available online. One way you could listen to it, if you wanted to, is on the Relevant Radio app. Relevant Radio is the network that I belong to. There are several really good Catholic radio networks in this country, uh, EWTN, for example, and various others. Well, one of them is Relevant Radio. And so I do my show every morning from, this is central time here, is that right? So I'm on the air here from 8 to 11 every morning. And out in LA, I'm on in drive time from 6 a.m. till 9. And my show, called The Patrick Madrid Show, does not have guests. I don't interview anybody. And for three hours, it's just you and me. And we talk about issues of the day. We get into technology, social issues. Sometimes politics comes up. There's a lot of God talk. So just today, for example, I had one atheist and one agnostic, just separate callers who called in and wanted to discuss why they thought believing in God was stupid. And so we had a lively discussion that was very friendly, but it got to the heart of a lot of these issues. And what I try to do on the show every morning is provide a great variety of different topics so that people who might not even be interested in religion would at least find the show interesting. And what I'm finding is that more and more non-religious people are listening to the program. So I, I was sharing last night at dinner with the Archbishop and with Peter my, my approach to this issue of radio and hopefully this will give you a sense of what I'd like to do today in my talk. If you consider a, a, a dartboard and imagine that the very center where the bullseye is, let's say that those are the committed Catholic folk. They're, you know, mom and dad in a minivan with the rosary hanging from the rearview mirror and the pro-life bumper sticker and two or three car seats in the van. They're committed. They're going to mass every Sunday. They are dialed in as Catholics. They really do believe and they're, they're working at it. Then maybe outside that first center circle there, then you've got people who are Catholic. They go to mass on Sunday, but it's not necessarily their first priority, but they're Catholic and they're proud to be Catholic and they love Jesus. And then outside of that, that category, you might find people who go to, to mass on Easter and Christmas. They might not ever go to mass in between those two holidays. And they're Catholic, perhaps culturally so, or they were raised Catholic, but they're not really like interested in the day-to-day -day workings of being a Catholic. And then outside of that group, you have the whole world of people who are Christian or they believe in God in some way or another, but they're not Catholic. And they may even have an animus toward the Catholic Church. They may have things about the Catholic Church that they strongly oppose. And then outside of that group would be the outermost ring, and that would be the people who are not interested in God at all. So they may be activists in certain, uh, in certain areas, or may, they might even be ardent atheists who see it as necessary to help poor Christians who are deluded into believing God in God. They think that Christians are anti-scientific, or that we're prone to violence, or we're superstitious, we believe in this invisible man in the sky, et cetera, et cetera. That outer group is the group I'm aiming for. So every morning on the show, I'm trying to talk to them. Now, it's not that I'm ignoring any of the people in the middle, but I figure it this way. I've already got most of those people. They're at least sympathetic. They're at least you know interested in some sense in the whole idea of God in an afterlife and so on. But if I can get the people in the outer ring who are actively opposed to what you and I believe as Christians, then I figure we've got a good chance. If they're at least interested, then they'll listen. And if they listen over time, eventually we can make some headway. And I don't have time, but if I did have time, I could share with you instances of people whose lives have been changed, stories after stories that I have come become aware of. One quick example was I got an email from a lady who, uh, this was probably about five years ago, I guess. She emailed me and she said, 
I listen to your program every day and I'm writing to you because I want you to know what Catholic Radio is doing in the lives of people like me. She says, until very recently, I used to be a very high priced call girl in San Francisco. And she described, you know, this this life making of a thousand dollars an hour, expensive clothing and handbags and purses and jet sets off to, you know, meals, private planes and things like that. And she said she was never a Christian. Her father was a fallen away Catholic. She never darkened the door of a church other than one time when she was a little girl. I guess her father took her to mass for some reason and she wanted to go back. And he said, why would you want to do that? So she lived in a broken home. She was very beautiful, and she figured out pretty quickly that this was an, a way that she could make a lot of money. So in her 20s, she got involved in prostitution. And she said she kept seeing a Catholic radio bumper sticker on cars while she was in traffic zipping around San Francisco. And she never turned it on. She never bothered to listen to it. But she said one day she was on her way to an appointment and she saw it for like the 50th time, this Catholic radio bumper sticker. And for some reason she thought, well, I wonder what that is. So she turned it on and she started listening to it. And she, as she described it to me, it didn't take long before over some time, some weeks or months, she listened her way out of of that lifestyle. She embraced her the Catholic faith of her father, who was a fallen away Catholic. She received the sacraments. She came into the Catholic Church, quit that lifestyle cold turkey, and she began leading a very kind of hidden and quiet life of devotion, going to daily mass and so forth. And when she sent me this email, I was so floored by it because I figure this is happening all around us. There are so many people out there for whom the idea of the Catholic Church is just not even on their radar screen. It's it's not even something they would even think about for whatever reason. And God is waiting around all sorts of interesting, surprising corners and is is ready to surprise them if only somebody will speak the truth about the faith to them. So I offer you my own experience in radio, which is just my experience, but you have your own contacts, your own social circles, people that you meet, strangers that you might sit next to on an airplane, that kind of thing. So my first point is simply to say that the beauty and the truth and the power of what we have as Catholics, everybody deserves that. But many people don't ever have a chance to receive it because many Catholics, present company excluded, of course, but many Catholics are very lackadaisical and apathetic when it comes to sharing the faith. So if I can offer any kind of encouragement to all of you here, it's you will be astonished by some of the miracles of conversion in people that might seem very far away or so far away that they would never consider Jesus Christ. They would never consider being a Catholic. And yet they do when they're exposed to this kind of information. So I, I hope you'll take a chance sometime and listen to my program. The easiest way to get it is on the relevant radio app. Just go to the app store or to Google Play and you could download it there. It's free and I think you'll find it helpful. I hope you will. Anyway, I was asked to speak on a topic that I know something about, not because I wrote a book called Why Be Catholic? 10 Answers to a Very Important Question, but because unlike like Scott Hahn and Tim Staples and Marcus Grodi and some of the big names that you're familiar with, I am not a convert. And I think a lot of people just assume that if you're in this work of apologetics, it's like a law that you have to be a convert. But um, I'm a cradle Catholic. I'm a token cradle Catholic. And so I come at this topic from the standpoint, not as somebody who had to go through a lot of difficulty and risk to acquire the Catholic faith the way some of these people had to do, but I had it handed to me. I became a Catholic when I was two weeks old and I had no say in the matter. My parents took me down to the parish church and had me baptized. And I grew up in a home in which my parents just taught us that our Catholic faith was our identity. It wasn't something we did for a week on Sunday, you know, check off the God box and we're done with that for the week. But I, I saw really through how they lived and the way our home was ordered, that the Catholic faith was the primary identity. And I don't mean like it was our club. I don't mean in that sense. But my mom and dad really do take seriously the teachings of Jesus Christ. And so they taught it to us as kids in this kind of effortless way. We had statues and images in our home, but it wasn't like a monastery. It didn't smell like incense at the Madrid house or anything like that. But it was clear if you walked into our home, you could tell, well, these people are Catholic because there'd be a crucifix and image of our our lady, that kind of thing. I remember when I was about five years old, 
And somehow or another, I discovered that not everybody in the world was Catholic. And I was blown away by this. I, I remember how I felt. I was just taken aback. How can it possibly be that there are people who don't believe what I believe as a Catholic? And I had been taught all these things by my parents. I didn't question any of it. I just assumed it was all true. And it was, it was strange to me to think that there were people who didn't believe that. And then when I got a bit older, I got into grammar school, and one incident really sticks out in my mind. I was on a, uh, on a, a field trip in the fourth grade, and the teacher told us that for this field trip, we had to practice the buddy system so that whoever we sat next to on the bus, we had to stick with that person for the whole day. So I beelined it over to this cute girl in my class, and I thought, well, I want to sit with her. I want to get to know her better. So sure enough, we spent this whole day together, this girl and I, and it was really a lot of fun, and I have a great memory of that field trip, but I remember specifically in the bus on the way home, she asked me, after all this fun that we had that day, she said, so what church do you go to? And I said, oh, I'm a Catholic, I go to St. Miscellaneous Church, and she, she looked at me with a look of disgust and disappointment, and she said, you're a Catholic? I said, yes, what's wrong with that? And she said, well, Catholics are idolaters. And I said, we are not. What's an idolater? I, you know, I, <laughs> I never heard the word before. I didn't know what it meant, but it didn't sound good. And she said it with such, you know, you know, just like horror. And she described to me that an idolater is somebody who worships statues. You worship idols, she said. Catholics are idol worshipers. I said, no, we're not. I mean, I, I had never seen anybody worship a statue. I'd never seen my parents do it. I knew it was ridiculous on the face of it. But she was convinced because at whatever church she was going to, they were teaching the people that Catholics are idolaters because we have statues. We have images. And later I discovered a passage in the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 20, where God says to Moses, do not carve any graven images of anything in the sky or in the earth or the waters beneath the earth. Do not bow down before them and worship them. And so in her fourth grade understanding, Catholics are idolaters because we have a crucifix or an image of Mary, that kind of thing. Now, later on, and I didn't know what to say to her, so that was the end of that relationship. It ended on the bus that afternoon. But I never forgot about it. And I never forgot the feeling of being at a loss for words to explain something that I knew wasn't true, but I didn't know how to defend it. I didn't know how to explain it. So I've often thought about that incident. And many years later, I began to discover as I started in my work in apologetics, there are many places in the Old Testament where God either permits or even commands the carving of religious statues. So just five chapters later in Exodus, God commands Moses to carve statues of angels, the two cherubim that would sit on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And if you haven't read Exodus lately, chances are you've all seen the movie Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark. Well, in that movie, you've got the Hollywood version of the Ark of the Covenant. So I just wish that I had known in the fourth grade the things that I had learned later in life about how it's not idolatry to have an image. We have sacred images for the same reason you carry pictures of your wife or your, your husband or your kids. And if you were to kiss a picture of your family, nobody would be freaked out and say, what's wrong with her? She likes Kodak paper. That's weird. You know, she's, it's not the paper and it's not the ink. It's the person represented by that. But I didn't know that in the first grade or the fourth grade. Uh, many years later, I was speaking in Chicago, and I'll never forget this is one of the, the best moments of my life in terms of coming up with something original that I could actually claim. I, I thought of that first. I pulled up in front of the church where I was going to speak that night, and on the front lawn were large, lifelike statues, life size statues of Our Lady of Fatima and then the children of Fatima. And the children's statues were kneeling in a prayerful attitude before the statue of. Mary and they had their hands folded and kind of their heads bowed in front of this statue. So I turned to my colleague in the car pointing at the statues. I said, what a great religion. Not only can we worship statues, but our statues can worship statues. <laughs> and I was really proud of myself when I thought of that. And, and so that evening when I started my talk by just telling that little story, the Catholics chuckled like you just did, I found out during the Q&A period that some of the non-Catholic folk who were there didn't understand why, why we were laughing. And the Baptist minister who came up to the microphone, he says, I don't understand why you Catholics were laughing because we know that you do worship statues. So by then I was ready. I was no longer in the fourth grade. And so I now had my apologetics ex 
explanation that I could share with him. Then f the next big milestone for me in the question of why be Catholic, because you, you can see now I'm starting to bump into the challenges against my Catholic faith. And little by little, I start to realize, oh, there's a whole lot more to this than I ever realized, a whole lot more than what my parents had taught me. In fact, I'm so grateful to my mom and dad. They're both still alive and they're doing well, thank God. They... None of, I'm the old, oldest of eight kids, I probably should mention that. None of my siblings ever left the Catholic Church, which is weird and unusual in a day like today when nobody has that. My parents can claim that all their kids remain faithful as Catholics. Not, not that we were saints, we certainly weren't, I certainly wasn't, but we never left the Catholic Church. So in my summer between my junior and senior year of high school, this is where it all sort of came to a head. And the question, why be Catholic, became very real to me. And that was, I think of it sometimes as kind of like my special golden summer because it was Southern California where I grew up and I had my driver's license and I had a little money because of my job. And I was also going out with this really cute girl in the area, her name was Christy. And that was like icing on the cake, it was perfect. Except for one thing. And that was that Christie's family was very devoutly evangelical Protestant, and her dad was very, he was a very good man, very, very nice man, but he was also really, really anti-Catholic. So there's this Catholic kid coming around the house now, and you know, I start going out with his daughter, and we're going to get pizza and go see a movie and go to the beach, that kind of thing. But I found out very quickly that the price of admission for me was whenever I would go to Christie's house, I would first have to sit down in the living room with Christie's dad, and he would get out the big King James Bible, and he would grill me mercilessly about my Catholic faith. And he told me right up front, he says, you know, you're a nice kid, but I got to tell you, you're not a Christian. I said, of course I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. He said, no, you believe in a different Jesus. I said, no, I believe in Jesus in the Bible. He says, no, you believe in a different gospel, a different Jesus. You practice works righteousness. You think you can earn your salvation. And he just gave me this long litany, but it was not all at one time. It was every time I would come over, I'd have to sit down and go through all this with him. And he would trap me. He would say, well, in your church, Pat, what do you call priests? And I said, we call him father. And he would smile and open to Matthew chapter 23, verse 9, where Jesus says, call no one on earth father, for you have one father who is in heaven. And then he'd say, so why does your church do something the Bible says not to do? And it was really frustrating for me because I didn't have an answer. And everything he would hit me with, I realized, okay, I should have an answer, but I don't. So I realized that I knew what I believed. I didn't know why I believed it. I didn't have any answers to these questions. And I, was felt, I felt very unsettled by it. But I also felt a kind of sense that I don't want to be embarrassed in front of this girl. I better find out. I remember one time her, her father gave me a tract a chick comic book tract. Maybe you've seen these little fundamentalist cartoon booklets. This one I think was called The Death Cookie, and it was against the Holy Eucharist. It had a picture of a host with a skull and crossbones on it, and he gave it to me. He said, read this because this will show you why what you believe about what you call the Eucharist is just pagan worship taken from the Babylonians and the ancient Egyptians. So like I would come home every time I'd been at Christie's house, and I'd say to my dad, okay, dad, here's the latest thing. Here's the death cookie. <laughs> and, and my father, God bless him, he would never be flustered. He never said, well, stop going to that house because, you know, they're going to, they're tearing down your Catholic faith. He was always just like, no problem. And he'd reach up on the bookshelf in our family living room library, and he'd pull a book down, and he'd say, the answer to that question's in this book. But he wouldn't tell me where it was in the book. He, he said, I, I had to find it myself. So I became like a detective, and I had my pride, and I didn't want to uh, go back time after time and be squashed but with these conversations that Christie's dad was, or the questions he was raising. So I began my due diligence and I started investigating, okay, what does the Bible say about this? Does the Bible actually say anything about the Eucharist or Mary or purgatory, etc.? And over time, what happened was the books that my father was giving me, these apologetics books, they began to convince me that not only were the answers more powerful than the challenges that her father was giving me, but I could see the biblical truth, the historical cohesion, the things that my mom and dad had taught me. I'm realizing one after the other, 
This is true. This is real. This is actually real. This is not something made up. And it goes back to the time of the apostles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you can picture a confidence meter, my confidence meter, at the beginning of the summer, my needle was in the red zone because I was on the run. And over time, the needle moved to the green zone where it stayed. And I discovered that long about the end of July, Christie's father no longer wanted to meet with me. So he, you know, I would come over and we would swim because I had to do a cost benefit analysis more than once that summer. <laughs> so on the one side, OK, I had the girl, they f the food because they would feed me when I'd go over there. They had a swimming pool. But then, of course, on the negative side, the cost side was her father. And so eventually it got to the point where I realized that her dad, he was a good man. I really liked him. But he never knew there was that there even was a Catholic response. He had never heard the Catholic response. So as far as he was concerned, Catholics had nothing to say for themselves. And so it became uncomfortable for him when I would bring back to him the fruit of my labor, digging through these books and through the Bible. And I'd say, well, sir, now I can tell you why we call priest father. And then I would start quoting St. Paul and St. Stephen. And I was giving all this from the New Testament and showing him how he was misreading uh, Matthew chapter 23, verse nine, et cetera, et cetera. By the end of the summer, I had, without even realizing what was happening, I had taken ownership of my Catholic faith because I understood it finally. And I understood the reasons for these teachings that I had been given as a Catholic. And it became real to me. And it became a kind of passion for me that th th I want other people to know about this. And I want my fellow Catholics to understand what I was discovering. And it didn't stop there. I mean, I'm learning my entire life. I, I continued to learn. And I had to deal with atheist arguments. And I dealt with arguments from various other groups. But it left me with a kind of unshakable confidence that I honestly can tell you today, I don't think I would have had ever had I not gone through that challenge. So kind of bringing things to full circle here. When I talk to people about why be Catholic, I bring those things up. I talk about the things that I found very challenging at first. I talk about salvation. Now, if I'm talking to fellow Christians, it makes sense to talk about things that we have in common, biblical issues. Um, and it's astonishing to see how many people, just like Christie's father, have never actually heard the case for the Catholic Church before. And when they do, it's very powerful for them. So I, I hope that maybe in your own lives, in the people that you run into, don't be afraid. Don't be nervous. Don't don't feel as, a, oh, my gosh, maybe they're going to quote a Bible verse that I won't know how to answer. Even if you don't know the answer then and there, the answers are already prepackaged for you on Catholic Radio, Catholic Answers, just go to Catholic.com. There's really no argument anymore that's been raised that hasn't been answered decisively. So we all have those at our fingertips. Um, the second thing is when I talk about the Catholic faith to people who are not believers, uh, I found a similar sense of confidence that when it comes to the rational case for believing in God, and I'm not talking about quoting the Bible or referring to Jesus or anything like that, but just bedrock rational proofs for the existence of God, looking at the reality of created things, for example, it's astonishing how powerful those rational evidences are. And they're not very complicated to explain to somebody. And you never have to mention the word Bible or, re or religion or anything like that. That too, I began to see is a huge area of need. And I see it every day or I hear it every day, I should say, on the radio. So then the third thing I'd like to leave you with is uh, just a little bit of uh, encouragement, perhaps, because you may say, well, I can't do what Scott Hahn can do, or I can't quote the Bible like Tim Staples. You don't have to do that. That's what I found out. It, that, that's not what helps people come closer to Jesus. It's the personal authenticity in which you, in your own limited way, and we're all limited, but in your own limited way, you say the truth and you speak it in a friendly, forthright manner. And I'll give you an example as I conclude my remarks. Um, you heard earlier that Nancy and I have 11 children. And just in case anyone's wondering, six boys, five girls. It's not a Brady Bunch deal, so it's the same wife. No twins, no triplets. <laughs> She had one baby after another. And they're all, thank God, they're all doing very well. And they're all grown up now with having children of their own. But when our youngest son, who's now 17, he's starting his senior year of high school. So he, I guess he's not grown up yet. Uh, but he, he was a baby. So he was an infant. 
And one day, Nancy had had a you know kind of a long busy day, and the kids were you know noisy as often happen. And so I said to her, "Honey, why don't you and I just go out and get dinner, just just us, and we'll let our older kids cook for the." And she was like, "Oh, that would be so great." So we got our youngest baby, Stephen, put him in the bassinet. We drove down to the local Olive Garden. And you probably have done this a million and one times. You go in, you get seated by the waitress. She sit, seats us in our booth, hands us our menus, and proceeds to ooh and ah over our little baby. So she says, oh, how cute, boy or girl, you know, how old, those kinds of questions. And then she asked the question that neither Nancy nor I wanted her to ask, which was, is he your first? <laughs> you see, my wife is very slim. She's very youthful looking. And so it, would, it was not an unusual question for this lady to ask her, is this your first? first child. So Nancy looks across the table at me and silently with her eyes, she says, do you want to tell her? And I shook my head, meaning, no, you go ahead and tell her. <laughs> so she smiled at the waitress and she said, no, he's not our first. He's our 11th. Now, this poor woman did not know how to act when she heard this information. She was flustered, she was jittery, and she couldn't believe it. So she ran off and got four or five more waitresses and brought them to our table. So now, picture the scene, Nancy and the baby, and I'm on this side, and we've got this semicircle of incredulous waitresses that are looking at us like 11 kids, and, and they were saying things like, how, why would you have 11 kids? And that's got to be so expensive, and you, by the look looks on their faces, you could tell they were kind of horrified. And I could see them looking at Nancy and thinking, you poor thing. <laughs> and they're looking at me thinking, you monster, you, you know, how can you do this to your wife? So in the middle of all this, then they start telling about their own personal contraceptive habits. So one of them says, she says, well, you know, we have two kids. That was enough for me. And I'm on the pill now. And another one laughed and said, yeah, well, I got my tubes tied. And the other one said, well, I made my husband get a vasectomy. And I'm sitting there thinking, I just want to get a plate of lasagna. I, <laughs> I don't even want these thoughts in my mind right now as I'm ready to order my food. So all the negativity, all the, you know, like, you know, the freak show had just shown up. In the middle of all that, my lovely wife, she smiled at these women and she said, in a very matter of fact voice, she said, well, my husband and I believe that children are a blessing from God and we believe in being open to life so that God can bless our marriage. And that's all she said. And she said it in that kind of mild tone of voice. And that was like putting water on a campfire because it immediately sort of dispersed all of the women. They went back to their work and we laughed like, you know, it's great because we've heard all the questions. Don't you have a TV? You know, are you through yet? Do you know what causes this? And what I say, you know, especially if it's a man who says that, I said, Jack, if you prefer TV to what causes this, there's something clearly wrong. Here. That's all I can tell you. So we're laughing and we finish our meal and we, you know, pay, I pay the bill, we get the baby and we go out to our minivan at the far end of the parking lot. And every time I pass by this restaurant, I think about what happened next. So we're getting into the minivan and I hear footsteps running up behind us. Somebody's running up to us in the dark. I turn around. It's our waitress. And under the street light above, I could see tears glistening in her eyes. And she says, she's kind of out of breath. She says, oh, I'm so glad I caught you. I just wanted to say thank you. And I knew she wasn't talking to me because the tip was not extravagant. I assure you of that. <laughs> she was speaking to Nancy. She said, I just wanted what you said in there about children being a blessing from God. She said, I guess I knew that. But being open to life so God would bless your marriage. She said, I've never heard anyone say that. And she said, when I heard you say that, I realized all of a sudden that is true. And she said, I have decided I'm getting off the pill. And when I get home tonight after my shift, I'm telling my husband because I want God, I want to be open to whatever God wants to bless my marriage with. And I just want to say thank you for saying that. And she gave Nancy a hug and she ran back inside. We've never seen her again. I'm convinced, however, that at least one person is likely to come up to my wife in heaven and say, you know, you don't know me, but my mom was your waitress at an Olive Garden a long time ago. And because of what you said, I'm here now. So I leave you with that as a kind of final thought. It doesn't have to be complicated. It does have to be heartfelt. It has to be genuine, but it doesn't have to be complicated and it doesn't have to be elaborate. But little things, little truths spoken in a way that's understandable and believable can go a long way. Thank you very much and God bless you.
minutes of Q&A. Okay, we'll do. Uh, Peter just told me um, we'll do a few minutes of Q&A before the trap door opens and I disappear. <laughs> he has a button. He can release the trap door at any moment. This book here is called Why Be Catholic? Ten Answers to a Very Important Question. And I think the title speaks for itself. If you would like a book that is uh, non-confrontational, it's not pushy, it's the kind of book you could give to a non-Catholic and not worry about them being offended, this would be the book. Second book, turns out I myself did not write this, but I figure into the story because this was written by a Catholic fellow by the name of Doug and he and his wife, his wife Heidi, they were all, they were like mountain goats. I mean, they loved each other very much, but she was a very strong Protestant. She wanted to convert him to be Protestant. He wanted to convert her to be Catholic. And the most amazing thing happened at a debate. And I won't tell you what it was, but this is a wonderful conversion testimony. Well, the, I just gave it away. She wound up becoming Catholic. But um, <laughs> it's a wonderful story, very well told. He's a very good writer. And if you would like to go along with them on this adventure of what, it, what happened and how she wound up becoming Catholic, this book I think you'll find very helpful and entertaining. Uh, Q&A for a few minutes, anybody? No? Okay, you can open the trap door, I guess, at any time. Well, so oh, here's I'll, a hand here. I was going to say, I'll ask a question. One of, the, one of the things that you guys may not know, but you've got one of the great apologetics teachers uh, in the country in front of us. So, I mean, I grew up in Amarillo where all my friends were Baptist and Church of Christ. Mm -hmm. And they all, to a person, thought I was going to hell. And yes, I know we have websites and whatnot, but I wonder if you might just for a minute, Patrick, tell me, for those friends of mine who just think I'm going to hell, and how do you start the conversation? Okay. Um, we're talking like a Baptist, for example. Okay. I, I would say, I would try to come at the person from an angle he's not expecting. So two things. One is I advocate in a kind of a, a, an apologetics technique known as the Socratic method, which is asking questions. And rather than allowing yourself to be put on the defensive, which so often happens to Catholics, don't let that happen. If you're the one asking questions, you'll always be not on the offensive, but you won't be on the defensive. And I'll give you an example of how it might look. So let's say your Baptist friend says, um, well, you're going to hell because you're a Catholic. My response would be, I mean, my temptation would be to say, no, I'm not. But my answer would be, um, what do you mean by that? And then it buys me a little bit of time because I can think. And he then, without realizing it, has the burden of proof back on him. Now he's got to, again, say what he means. And he may repeat it. He may amplify. It doesn't really matter. And then the temptation is to say why that's not true. But the second thing I would say is when he says, he restates his argument, I'd say, how did you come to that conclusion? Now, again, the burden of proof is back where it belongs. It's on him now. So now he has to defend his position and he's, and he's going to say, well, because the Bible says this and the Bible says that, and you do this and you do that. Then my next question might be really, so are you saying that you take the Bible as your sole authority, that you believe that the Bible alone, is that what, is that what you're saying? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Then I might say, well, where does the Bible teach that? Where does the Bible teach that doctrine that you only go by those doctrines you find in the Bible? Now, all of us know the Bible nowhere teaches that. It's a presupposition that is brought into this question, but the Bible simply does not teach. It actually teaches the opposite of that. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.15, St. Paul says, I urge you, brothers, to stand firm and hold fast to the traditions you receive from us, either by an oral statement or by a letter of ours. So it's very explicitly saying, do not go by scripture alone which would be a handy verse for you to know, and so on and so forth. So I would try to direct the conversation by asking questions. And the whole time, I'm not on the defensive, and his argument will begin to sort of break down. And then I'll be able to figure out, okay, this is an area that we really should concentrate on. Yes, Father. Thank you, Lord. Lord God. Uh, I feel like Oklahoma County Jail is the deep end of the circle. And you have never been into How would you go about I have two minutes, so I'll have to be brief. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, yeah, th this one might be useful to you, but there are other books. If you go on Amazon and type in Patrick Madrid, it'll bring up all my books. You might, you might see one that would be particularly useful to you. In two minutes, I don't know how much I can elaborate, but I would say when you ask somebody about his own situation and ask questions, it will begin to emerge little by little what the issues are. Or so rather than assume if I go into this guy's cell and say this, 
that that's what he needs to hear, I would say query him about different things and see what comes to the surface and then maybe go after that. Or the next time you're there, bring him. Oh, I remember you said that thing about the Bible. I brought you something to read that talks about the Bible, for example. And then just to come back full circle to relevant radio, I hear from uh, people who do prison ministry around the country that although the prisoners sometimes can't have books or they can't have things brought in from the outside, they can listen to the radio. So if the chaplain will put relevant radio on the app and play it, it's remarkable how many inmates will write in and say, we hear you uh, behind bars and it's helpful to them. So that would be another suggestion I would make. And please, uh, if you haven't seen the relevant radio app, please check it out. Hope you will. Uh, real quick. Oh, yes, sir. You said you could go to Amazon and buy your books. Are your books also available at EWTN Religious Catalog? I believe some of them are. I'm not sure if this particular one is, although it may be. Uh, and over the years, uh, many of my books have been there. In fact, we've turned some of them into EWTN TV series. So I haven't checked the catalog lately, but I wouldn't be surprised if some of them are there. Thank you. Yeah, and it's a good way to support EWTN as well. Thank you, Thank you all. God bless you.